Hello, everyone. This is the podcast introduction to this week's Listening to America. I'm talking with John and Colleen Graybill of Buena Vista, Colorado, about their Descendants Project with respect to Edward S. Curtis. Edward S. Curtis, 1868 to 1952, was a photographer. Dry glass plate and the negatives. The glass plates were 5x7, 8x10, 11x18 giant glass plates. And he took, apparently, as many as 40,000 of them over the course of his lifetime. He was a prominent studio photographer in Seattle, uh, he had a kind of a conversion experience when he was on the Blackfoot Reservation with uh, with his friend George Bird Grinnell. He then photographed the Roosevelt children at Sagamore Hill and became a friend of Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt uh, supported him, not financially, although he bought a copy of the complete North American Indian. Uh, he subscribed, but he wrote letters of introduction and supported him when there were controversies. And Curtis uh, convinced J.P. Morgan, the famous art collector uh, and financier J.P. Morgan, to, to fund in part the project. We now have the 20 volumes of the North American Indian. It's an amazing thing. Uh, I spent all this time in, in, in the interview today uh, asking questions of, of John and Colleen. Um, I did not talk about my own project, but I want to say a little bit about that. So I'm doing something that's sort of similar, parallel. I began, you know, we, we both began without knowing that the others were doing it, but they, they actually um, complement each other in an important way. I'm interviewing native elders from the 70 uh, tribal nations that he visited. Not all of them, of course. My goal is 35 to 50 video interviews. Uh, these are video interviews, and I'm talking to these uh, commentators, these elders, who then comment on specific photographs, what's going on in such and such a portrait. You know, what's that headdress? Why is why are there porcupine quills? Is that trade cloth or is that um, bison? Uh, what sort of sacred objects are here? Um, does that family still have descendants uh, who are alive today? Um, you know, what do you what kind of um, uh, attitude do you sense in in the photograph? Uh, we do that, and and these will become little vignettes on specific photographs that you will be able to look at with a QR code or on a kiosk or on a website. But there also are longer commentaries about what Curtis did. You know, we didn't really talk about it today, but he's been accused of a number of things. A, he was white. Uh, and that uh, today uh, matters more than it did then. Uh, he uh, sometimes manipulated his subjects a little bit. Um, he paid and sometimes bribed people who were desperately poor to sit for portraits and to show him things uh, that maybe they were not that willing to show. He intruded a little bit on the sacred from time to time. Uh, there are a couple of, of harrowing stories about that. He romanticized natives. Um, he carried along some um, costuming, let's call it, some robes and some um, shawls and some headdresses and so on. Normally, he did not use those, but uh, when, when necessary, he was willing to say, "Why don't you? Why don't you wear this?" Uh, you know, there are a number of issues. Um, I think that on the whole, Curtis's achievement was of monumental importance and that these things are issues, but they are not terminal issues. They're not cancel issues. They're not uh, discrediting in a, in, a, in a fundamental way. At any rate, I'm doing this, and I've so far done five of these interviews. I'm going to do about, as I say, 50 in seven regions all across the American West, not east of the Mississippi, because that was not his focus, but through the American West, the Canadian West, and Alaska. I will certainly uh, do that over the next few years if you want to support this project. It's one of the most important things that I've ever done, um, because it's of, of importance way beyond my own little career. Uh, when you see these interviews, and you see an, a native elder looking at a photograph and silent for 50 15 or 20 seconds or two minutes for that matter and then beginning to I'm using air quotes to read it and one of the greatest interviews was done by my friend Gerard Baker who's Hidadza now living near Miles City Montana unfortunately that interview had to be done on zoom but it's still uh, amazing and we were looking at a, a photograph of a Mandan woman with a bull boat a kind of a, a saucer like boat made of buffalo strung over strung tightly over uh, willow boughs a kind of a basin Lewis and Clark talk about this these these bull boats existed well into the 20th century. The, the, the Mandan people didn't go up and down rivers. Uh, they went across rivers, and so they needed this very simple craft. It could be made in a few hours if necessary. And so there's a woman uh, who's, who's partly bent over, and there's a bow boat behind her, and there's a cliff. And so I'm, and this is in, in uh, near Washburn or Stanton, North Dakota. It used to be the heart of the Mandan world. And Gerard Baker, who's Hidatsa, who's from there, and who has a very long and extremely distinguished career in the National Park Service, among other things, was reading this photograph. He said, well, that, that bull boat is not, that's not buffalo hide, that's cow hide. So there must not have been buffalo hide available by the time Curtis got there. This would be around 19. 
eight, I think. And so they had to use cowhide now. Uh, and he said that, you know, this woman had to make X number of these before she could make one for herself, that there's an apprenticeship and a training program, and there's a, there, uh, there's a sacred uh, process, a, a set of sacred rituals that go into this. He read the cliff and said, I think I know where that is, or certainly I know about where that cliff is. He was able to see things in this photograph that I could never have seen. I don't think an anthropologist necessarily would have seen an art historian um, almost certainly wouldn't have seen, but he could see it because, of course, that's his own heritage, his own culture. And he was able to explain it to me and others. And, and he said, she's she's wearing trade cloth. You know, in other words, it was clothing woven on a loom um, back east somewhere or, or, you know, in England or Canada. And so he was able to see all these things. And it's just so extraordinary to be part of this process. And, you know, my, my job is just to put up the photograph and get out of the way and ask some follow-up questions, but to be as silent as possible. And you have to be willing to put to go through you know, periods of silence because most Native Americans that I know, and it's, of course it's ridiculous to generalize, but most Native Americans don't just blurt stuff out. They think it through, and particularly when they're trying to decide how do I say what I have to say to non-Natives, you know, to people who are looking from the outside in rather than from the inside out. This is an amazing, amazing project, and I sort of fell into it because I did an exhibit at the TR Center, the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University, and, and uh, it was a, the exhibit was Roosevelt and Curtis, the Rough Rider and the Shadow Catcher. And Curtis's uh, name given to him by natives was the Shadow Catcher because he was, you know, capturing light through his camera lens. I'm very proud of that exhibit. It's, it's been um, dismantled now, but it's available to travel. I hope it will travel to other Roosevelt-related sites around the country. And I wanted to have some commentary on the images because, you know, Curtis was a white man with a great noble soul, but he was a white man. And I, I too, am a non-native. And so I wanted to make sure that the that the discourse was generated by Native people, that they were um, encouraged to tell their own story, and that and without them in the in the mix, without Native commentary, that, that the exhibit would be less, and indeed much less. And so that's how this began. And so I've managed to get some very early funding for this. I've got a plan to do about you know, ten interviews in the year 2024. Uh, it's going to take five or six years to do all of this, and of course the equipment gets better and easier to use. Uh, every year um, and there's a network you know once you've met one elder my friend Jack Gladstone who is a Pigan he's a Blackfeet and then he knows of people elsewhere and they know of people elsewhere and suddenly you begin to build a kind of a network of, 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 of people who know something that's important but are also willing to talk with non-natives um, coming uh, to their part of the world um, it's deeply satisfying if you if you want to help us we could use all the help we can get you know we really just need money uh, to um, and gas cards and so on to be able to, to do all of this because it's not inexpensive to go to the Hopi world or to the, the Paiute world or to the Mojave world or the Shoshone world or the Nimipu world or the Clatsa world uh, or the Apache or Comanche world or the Lakota world or Cheyenne and so and Absaroka the crow so this is the plan and um, I'm so pleased to know John and, and Colleen Graybill uh, they have an amazing connection to the great man himself of course but Colleen was a photographer in her own right and she and John are both photographers and are now partnering uh, this is not the story of Edward S. Curtis and his long-suffering wife Clara this is a partnership of John and Colleen and I'm just so pleased to be able to share a little bit of what they're doing with you and truly this would be a great Christmas gift for you to give to people that you care about their latest book Edward S. Curtis Unpublished Plains, or his previous book, Edward S. Curtis, Unpublished Alaska. So anyway, that's this week's program. This is going to be a big part of my life over the next couple of years. I should say before I uh, send you to the show, a lot of what I know about uh, thinking about Native Americans and working with Native Americans and learning from Native Americans comes from David Swenson, uh, you know, the, the now retired semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Uh, he, he has uh, achieved an extraordinary rapport with Native peoples. On, on the northern Great Plains, and you know his his humility um, is uh, amazing to see. And because of that, the, 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 the purity of David's heart and and the and the humility of his manner, uh, he has been invited into a world that most of us uh, would never be allowed to see. So let's go to the program. Happy holidays to you all. Uh, this is uh, listening to America. Edward S. Curtis and the work of John and Colleen Graybill of Buena Vista, Colorado. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Listening to America. I'm Clay Jenkinson, and I have the great pleasure today to be talking with two of my friends, John and Colleen Graybill of Buena Vista, 
Colorado about Edward S. Curtis. Welcome. Hi, Clay. Hi, Clay. Thanks for having us. Good to see you there in the mountains, in the interior mountains of Colorado. And for those who might be sending in snarky comments, it is Buena, not Buena Vista, right? <laughs> That's right. That is correct. <laughs> I was uh, corrected the last time I was there when I tried to pronounce it in the full European way. We know who's right. local and who's not. Exactly. Tell us who Edward S. Curtis is. 1868 to 1952. As it would happen to be, uh, Edward Curtis is my great grandfather. He was a um, hardworking man, shall we say, and uh, did a ton of odd jobs growing up around the house to make ends meet in the, with the family. While they were staying in or near St. Paul, uh, he did do an apprenticeship as a photographer in a local studio for a short period. And we believe that's where his interest started with photography. As time goes on, you know, the family has this horrible winter and uh, they're destitute, they're dirt poor, the true definition of dirt poor. Yes. And so he and his dad moved to Sydney, Washington, Washington Territory at the time. That's near Puget and, Sound. That's in the Puget Sound area. Yeah, yeah, Clay. And, and currently today it goes by the name of Port Orchard. And uh, I think most people would be familiar with that. It's a beautiful spot on the Olympic Peninsula. It's just gorgeous. So he's sort of a handyman trying to keep the family finances together. He moves out there with his father, but he had had some interest in photography already in the Midwest. Yes. And uh, so he and his father, they hand build this log cabin on the property that they're homesteading, you know, and, and they get the cabin all ready over the winter and they send for the rest of the family to come out. And they do, except for the older brother, Ralph, who uh, stays back. Three days later, after the family arrives, old man Curtis passes away and Edward finds himself having to support the family yet again. Does all kinds of odd jobs. You know, he's cutting wood, he's fishing, firewood, whatever he can do that, uh, that you would do back in those days. But he hurts his back logging, and that back injury lays him up in bed for nearly a year. During the course of that year, young neighbor, neighbor, neighbor girl uh, by the name of Clara Phillips starts coming by helping his mom to kind of nurse him back and look after him. And also during this period, we believe it was while I was laid up in bed at this cabin, watching the play of light that would go through during the course of the day, that he really becomes in, intrigued with this and, and how it plays on subjects. When he, when he finally is healed enough to get out of bed, he realizes he can no longer do physical work. He's going to have to do something else. And so decides to rely on those photography uh, skills that he learned back in St. Paul. And so he mortgages the property, I think much to his mom's chagrin, but he does, and buys into a photography studio in downtown Seattle, across the pond, if you will. <laughs> it was that uh, start there that really leads him on his journey. And he goes through a couple of studios uh, before he has his own studio in his own name, and he becomes like the place to go. He's a sort of famous portrait photographer for the well-off, yeah. the rich, the celebrities, the, the people that really want to impress each other with their portraits. He becomes, we all remember that era in American history with the, with the great studio portrait photographers. Exactly, Clay. And, it, and it's like if you're anybody and need a portrait, this is the studio you go to, the Curtis Studio. So this does not involve Native Americans so far. No, no, not yet. I can only imagine the line out the door waiting to get their pictures snapped by uh, Curtis. So he's got people lined up. One of the really fun things that he did, Clay, uh, is he took member photos of the Arctic Club, which was just around the block from the Rainier Club in downtown Seattle. If you go into the Arctic Club today, you'll see almost like wallpaper, eight by tens, lining the lobby of, of the Arctic Club. And they've all got the curse sig signature on these on these headshots, basically. So he That's marries Claire. He marries this woman who who got him through his uh, long, difficult year, Clara. Um, he, he does. They start to have he, children, he, and he's you know John and Colleen. He's he is on his way to becoming a prominent, highly regarded social elite portrait photographer and wealthy. And instead of just riding out that career, which he could easily have done. He, he turns the direction entirely. He does. And Clay, I think it, uh, he got bored with the portrait work in the studio. I mean, if you can only imagine the line of people waiting to get his, their photo done by Curtis, I, I think he gets bored. He starts venturing out around the Seattle area. Uh, he does a lot of 
mountain climbing and exploring Rainier, St. Helens, Baker, and these mountains in the area with his camera and does some beautiful work. In addition to that, uh, he ventures out down along the shoreline. And there's still natives in this area because this is late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, he photographs people such as Princess Angeline on the shores, digging clams, picking mussels. And I, I think this starts something in him. He, he sees something, he's intrigued. Well, somewhere around that point, he invites Angeline up, up to the studio to do a portrait session. You know, and for those that don't know, Princess Angeline is like the last Native American that the Seattleites allow to live within the city limits. I mean, there are literally laws preventing Natives from living within the city limits. Yeah. And so it's a it's a white-only city at this point. White-only, except for Princess Angeline. You know, he was the daughter of Chief Seattle. Right, Selth, or you know, however you pronounce Selth, that, but she or, was the uh, daughter. Uh, right? yeah. yeah, however that's pronounced, yes. <laughs> From which the Seattle was named. So he took a famous photograph of her that is, um, most people who wouldn't know who Edward S. Curtis is have probably seen that photograph or his Canyon de Chez, which is justly famous, or yeah, his okay. Chief Joseph, which he took in a studio in Seattle, or maybe his portrait of Red Cloud, but almost everyone, whether they know his name or not, has seen a Curtis photograph. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's our experience. We run into people all the time. They ask us what we do. We say, who's that? Who's Curtis? You know, but you show them the picture. Ah, yes. So, okay. So, so you think the seed of his great career is born by those photographs on the shore and bringing Angeline into the studio? I do. I absolutely do. I think it sparks something inside of him. He realizes that these people are maybe not the way they've been portrayed by the dominant society in Seattle at this point, that there's something else there. There's far more there than what people are giving him credit for. You know, and, and along the same time period, he's gone north of Seattle up into Tulalip Reservation, and he's been taking pictures up there as well, and with Princess Angeline, uh, as early as 1895, he's doing uh, photographic work with natives. And he's selling these out of his studio. I mean, it's point of income for him. People are fascinated with Indian portraits, with the Native American portraits. And so he's thinking of this as a, as a commercial venture. I'll take some photographs of Native people. I'll sell them from my studio. It'll supplement my income. Absolutely. He has what they call an Indian corner in the studio where he markets this stuff. And he's got it all decked out in baskets, pots, uh, blankets, the photographs that he's done. So Colleen, I want to ask you a question. So, you know, John said that he was sort of physically disabled and couldn't do physical work. Well, yes, that's true. He couldn't lift logs anymore, but this is a physical specimen. He climbed Mount Rainier when that was a very difficult thing to do repeatedly. He saved people on Mount Rainier. He took these cameras, which weighed 50, 60 pounds with all the glass plate negatives up this mountain without the kind of gear we routinely uh, rely upon today. This is a really strong man. Yes. Yeah. He, he would climb Rainier with a small backpack and basically a piece of luggage or his camera with a handle on it, you know, just in his hand with a walking stick and go climbing up the glacier. You know, I climbed Mount Whitney a couple of years ago. I wouldn't even take my cell phone because it was one ounce too many. He's carrying these very heavy cameras. So, all right, let's flash forward. So he, he goes on the Harriman exhibition to Alaska, it takes something like 4,000 photographs, which is a kind of a a rapid fire apprenticeship on how to do this in the field comes back and George Bird Grinnell, whom he met on Mount Rainier, we think, invites him to come out to Browning, Montana to photograph what was thought maybe to be the last Sundance of the Blackfeet Nation. So pick up the story there, John. As the story goes, he and Bird meet at the train station. They, they've got their horses. They pack the horses up with all their gear. You know, and So they've got their camping gear. Curtis has got the wax the Edison wax cylinder machine that Harriman introduced to him. Uh, on audio the recording device, also very heavy. Very heavy, yes. Uh, he's got his camera gear, his photographic supplies. They pack these horses up and they head off north of Browning up towards the reservation. And as the story goes, they meander on up, up the trail for a while and they come to this cliff, this overpass. And when they get to that, they look out into the field below them and there's hundreds of teepees down there. I, it gives me goosebumps to think there's about. There's a great that. Curtis photograph of that panorama of those yeah. lots. 
it's not one of his greatest photographs from a purely photographic point of view, but for its impact and for how much how moving it is, it's one of the best. Ab- absolutely, Ca- capturing the essence of that encampment, and I think he names it Sun- Sundance Encampment. That particular photo, he ends up spending time there, you know, and and he talks to the chief, and the chief says, "Well, you can photograph whatever you like." And of whom will ever give you permission to photograph them, but you can't photograph the sunlights. Which may still be true in most of Native American country. You talk about the moment when Princess Angeline and, and on the shore in, in Puget Sound, certainly the seed is there. But I think the moment when he made the decision to give essentially the rest of his career to Native American photography was in Browning, was on the Blackfeet Reservation. And, and tell me if I'm wrong about this. Grinnell said to him, you know, you should exhibit these or you should maybe put a book together or you should do something, you know, something more with these. And he said, oh, I will. And it wound up being 20 volumes, one of the greatest achievements, not only of ethnography in North American history, but of photography. One of the New York papers later said it's as big a project as the translation of the King James Bible. So we're talking about almost like a a Pauline conversion experience where a very prominent studio photographer winds up giving his life to this really bold, difficult, maybe impossible adventure to capture Native American culture, dress, visage, lodging, landscape before it was too late because he believed that Native Americans were going to fade somehow from the scene. It was not just Curtis's thought. These people would no longer be here in just a few years. They wouldn't assimilate and they would pass on and everything would be gone and lost. That's a great introduction to Curtis getting him into the field. Now when we come back, I want you to describe what it was like. And Colleen, I think I would ask you to say a little bit about poor Clara, because I'm guessing that she did not think when all of this started that he was essentially going to be gone for the next three decades. You're listening to a special edition of Listening to America. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Listening to America. John and Colleen, it is so great to know you and to admire your work. I didn't know that you were the great grandson of the great Edward S. Curtis. I did a big project in Seattle. I got a chance to talk to 15 or 20 different venues about the work of Curtis. Uh, You were at a couple of them, and we met through mutual friends, and uh, you not only told me of of, of the fact that you, you have a very large archive of Curtis materials, including hundreds, maybe thousands of photographs that have never been published. You know, he, he's said to have taken 40,000 photographs. That may be an exaggeration, but a lot. And only a couple of thousand wound up in the North American Indian uh, project. So most of them, as we like to say now, wound up at the cutting room floor, but you have them. So you're publishing books based on that, the first two of which have come out. You're also involved in something called the Descendants Project. I'll let you describe it, but as I understand it, you are going into Indian country, finding people who are direct descendants of people that are pictured, that are photographed by Curtis, and interviewing them and taking their portraits with a very high quality camera. Is that correct? That, that's exactly right, Clay. And, and the way I tell people is I'm using the same technology that Curtis used, which is an old, old-fashioned old view camera. Uh, the lens I'm using is probably out of the late 1800s, a Turner Wright. And then I'm uh, using dry, dry plate glass negatives. How big are these glass plates? It's a whole plate format, which is six and a half by eight and a half inches. It's a piece of glass is- with, with, with silver nitrate emulsion on it and this is not like a giant sd card is it (laughs) absolutely not this is one of the things that really freaked colleen out at first because you know we're both digital photographers you too colleen are a photographer right yeah she is an excellent photographer so we're out there you know using this camera taking a picture we both are dependent upon that feedback we want to check histogram and make sure exposure and everything's set make sure we didn't miss anything i gotta take those glass plates back to the dark room to process and then look at you don't know when you take the photograph if it's going to so-called turn out right and so you don't know until you get to a dark room whether your your portraits have succeeded yes yeah. That's the advantage that we both have is that we started out shooting film and we know that process well and know where our limitations are. So having that long history as professional photographers 
helps jumping into that large format and the glass dry plates. So Curtis had many cameras of different sizes, 11 by 18, uh, 8 by 10, 5 by 7, and others. Eventually, I think towards the end of his life, he actually used a little bit of film, film. But do you treat your own plates or do you buy them already ready? No, I've been purchasing them from Jason Lane, and uh, he, he does an excellent job on it. He's taken a little bit of a sabbatical while he rebuilds and redarkroom, but yeah, predominantly I've, I've used his, his glass plate negatives. So let's say you're in front, you're, you have a descendant. You're working with a descendant, let's say, on the Pine Ridge uh, Reservation, and that descendant has decided what to wear and is now posing for you. Here's what I understand about dry glass plate. You have to pull it out in a slide, and then you have to put it in the back of the camera. Then you pull the, the thing that kept it from being exposed. Now you, you've, you're looking at it upside down in your viewfinder. You decide on that. You have to determine the number of seconds for the exposure. Now you say, don't move. And for X <laughs> seconds, that person holds that look, that pose. Then you put the slide back down into the frame, pull the frame out, put it in a bag, and then the next frame, right? So with my, with my cell phone here, I could take... 200 photographs in a minute. How long does it take a photograph for you? Well, from start to finish, it's probably 15 minutes per exposure, I would say. And Colleen, what are you doing while he's sweating here, taking these photographs, these five images? I'm helping to set up the, the photograph. I'm watching to make sure how much movement the person has, whether they blink during the exposure. Because, um, uh, you know, just breathing, we naturally move just slightly and a half an inch will make a difference between where he focused and then where he actually, where that person is when he actually clicked the shutter. If they're a half an inch off, it's going to be out of focus. How many individuals have you photographed so far in this great project? So far, we've completed work with 18. Amazing. And that's traveling all over the American West. I mean, that's not something that just happens in central Colorado. Like, I'm sure we've been places where Curtis had his wagon. You know, and we talk about that with the natives. You know, your ancestor, my great-grandfather, they were probably right here doing the same thing we're doing. It's a wonderful experience. It truly is. Yeah. Uh, difficult, and, complex, time-consuming, amazing, and noble. So you've got X number that you've done so far. What's your goal? Currently, uh, the goal for at least this first phase is uh, to work with 30 people. So you're about halfway. Yeah, a little bit more than halfway. Mm -hmm. And as you know, as we know, and probably a lot of your audience, that uh, Curtis came under quite a bit of criticism. And one of those criticisms was for staging and posing his subjects. Because of that, every person that we work with I ask them to come dress the way they want to be remembered and they pick where the photograph's going to be. And then I make it work somehow. So let's just say that the photograph, the person you, you're you going to take the portrait of comes in, in jeans and a baseball cap. You're okay with yeah. that? Yes. Absolutely. So you are, you are making no attempt to manipulate this process. They get to choose exactly yes. what they're going to wear and within limits how they're going to pose because you, you can't do action photos but this is granting them an enormous amount of personal integrity and agency that something that curtis i think didn't always manage to do yeah i think he was predisposed to making sure they had their regalia and, and some setting that would portray them in, in their uh, native home homeland well he was trying to tell a story he, he was and with the image just as we do when we once we we talk to the descendant and know what they want to wear how 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 they want to be portrayed and in what kind of location, then we can dial that in to find the right light because there's certain things you can't do with just natural lighting and... and Well, yes, we use zero artificial lighting. It's all natural. All right, so let me get this straight. You leave Buena Vista in a, in a train and you go to Winslow and you hire a wagon with four horses and the wagon rumbles across these trails that have no roads and you finally get to the end of that and then you get on mule and you go in and finally you're at this spot and you meet the elder or the or the descendant and then you do this preliminary work about how they're going to what they choose to, to wear and, and, and where they want to be photographed then you take these five or so images of them over over half a day or so but meanwhile aren't you also interviewing them on video 
Absolutely. So, you know, and it started out, we were interviewing them on video so we didn't have to take handwritten notes during the interview. We wanted to be present and focused on that. And uh, so then I take the audio out of the video, transcribe it, and then we have all that information firsthand. Since that initial start, we're incorporating the video or pieces of that video into the project and, and uh, how we portray these people. We want them to have their actual voice heard oh, as much as we can possibly do. So these videos allow us to let them tell their own story. And when you get back and develop the, the, the glass plates, as I understand it, you then present to that family, that person, a beautiful print of the portrait that you took. Yes, you know, and, and so like anything in the film, especially this really old technology, things don't always work out. And uh, so they'll say, well, so we're gonna get five images? And I said, well, if all five come out, absolutely. You can pick whichever ones or all of them that you want. Because of the focus issue that Colleen was describing, there may only be one or two images that are really usable. And uh, they can have access to that stuff all they want. So we send them a larger print and then we send them a bunch of smaller prints that they can share with family. We feel it's incredibly important for them to have a physical print to share and to keep in their family archives. Digital is going to become a problem real soon with it not being passed down through the family. Oh yeah, the transmission of, of digital imagery and movies and yes. so on is going to be a gigantic crisis in the next 50 years. But I've known you for a few years now. Uh, this is time consuming. This is not inexpensive. And I don't think that you're in this for the money. You're not going to get rich doing this. So I know you're the great grandson, but what's propelling you to do something that's really a, a very huge amount of effort? Why are you doing this? Well, it started out as kind of, well, what if, and has led to this, um, it's morphed into something far deeper in meaning for Colleen and I. And uh, what we have found with every single Native person that we've worked with, these people are by far some of the most incredibly warm, loving, heartfelt people I've ever met. And they have a story to tell. And that connection and from the past, and whether people know that history or not, we bring that past to the present for a further interpretation. And then our material will transcend into the future uh, for many generations to come, we hope. The, the story of resilience and healing that they share with us, the tribulations that they go through in, in modern day life, surprisingly, is not too dissimilar to what their ancestors were going through 120 some years ago when Curtis worked with them. It, it's kind of amazing that there hasn't been that much progress in that, in that realm. And so uh, we hope uh, in doing this with these people that the viewers of our material can feel that same heartfelt appreciation that we have for these people, that they'll gain an appreciation for the culture that is incredibly spiritual and deep beyond imagination. And uh, that they can embrace these people, tear down the biases and prejudices that exist today and see them as human, loving human beings. When you started this, you know, you knew of your great grandfather's achievement, which is, um, you know, staggeringly beautiful and important. Did you know that the native people that you were going to meet were going to affect you, to move you, uh, deepen your own souls in the way that they have? No, I, not in my wildest imagination, would I have dreamt that I'd be in the place that I am today. And I think it's the same for Colleen. Some of these people have, have become some of our best friends, a tribute to, they, they realize that we care and that we're doing this from our heart. We're not being paid for this. It's just important for us to carry this legacy forward and not only tell Curtis's story more, but he, his name and his work opens doors so easily for us to bring in these native voices and give them that platform to then tell their story. Now, and... you two are, are Anglos, you're, you're white Americans. You know, one of the issues today, as you know, is who gets to do this kind of work. You and I have interviewed a few of the same people, and one of my favorites, a man named Aaron Breen of, of the Crow, rather the Absaroka world in Montana, said when I went, okay, here comes another white guy who wants something from us. 
He was sort of teasing and he was sort of not. You know, it's an issue. People are always coming into Indian country and wanting something or saying, here's what we're going to do for you or we have an idea. And natives are have been around for a long time and this isn't their first rodeo. They're openly, at least initially, skeptical of non-natives who come rolling in uh, with big ideas. So I know your hearts are good, but how do you how do you overcome that resistance? I would have to say we don't. That if someone is resistant or doesn't want to tell their story, then we don't we don't pressure them. And we we just keep going till we find the people that want to share their story, that they're extremely appreciative of the history that Curtis captured for their family and their ancestry. And we, um, we've we said all along that if we get to a roadblock, that, you know, we're not going to keep knocking on that door, that we will just keep going to where the door's open. But I, I know, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really good answer, but I also think there's, there's a little bit more to it. I think, and you're probably too modest to say, but I think you will agree, and I want to hear this, to a very surprising um amount these native people have let you in they they have let you through the barriers that they hold and they've let you into their lives and to a certain degree into their hearts which is an amazing thing isn't it yes it is clay and, and i would say when we work with these natives um, we're both extremely humble uh, we're acutely aware of the history that they have gone through that their ancestors have gone through uh, with the u.s government in this country and uh, we're sensitive to that and over and over when we're done working with these people they tell us that they can sense what's in our heart and uh, somehow we project that and they open up to us and even aaron bren <laughs> my goodness it you know, and I, he was one of our best interviews too. We he was he him. was a hoot. He had a wonderful sense of humor with sarcasm built in. He speaks the truth, you know. And I had talked to him about uh, one of the questions interviews. Aaron, what do you want to tell the white people? in the world today. And in a nutshell, stay away. We don't need your help was his answer, you know. And he goes on to explain in a little bit more depth that being the cultural preservation officer on Crow Agency, he's tasked with slowing down the erosion of their culture. And he portrays that this is a massive loss of culture that he's experiencing in his life in today's world. And he doesn't have time for any other distractions. He doesn't have time for white tourists coming in wanting to do this or that. It doesn't fit. He has certain official responsibilities for the Absaroka people. So, and I think you've told me that in some of these cases, you go down and spend a day or two. The individuals you meet are inviting you into their homes. You share meals with them. There's a sense of communion that is a really cross-cultural and healing. Absolutely. I, I, I believe it's healing for them, but uh, I also believe it's healing for us. When I have come to terms with what the white Anglos, the settlers had done in this country to the indigenous population, there's an incredible amount of guilt in knowing that some ancestor of mine was a part of that. I have a hard time reconciling with what was done. So it's a healing process on both sides, I believe, for us and for them. So just, we're going to take a break here in a minute. We want to get back to Curtis for a second. So he took around 40,000 photographs, produced these 20 volumes. He did road shows, kind of a picture opera, which had colored slides and music that was original for this, what he called an opera, including a Carnegie Hall. He made a full-length documentary, a docudrama film. Um, he was always starved for money. He became friends with Theodore Roosevelt, and Roosevelt supported him, at least with letters of introduction. And the key moment was when Curtis went to see J.P. Morgan in New York, and he showed him his portfolio. Morgan said, go away. I, don't, I, get, I get a lot of requests. I'm not interested. Please, just... I." And Curtis said, no, I'm not going away till you look at the portfolio, which was a bold thing to do in the presence of the very, very formidable J.P. Morgan. And Morgan paged through, and he saw this photograph of Mosa, a Mojave young woman, and he said, you can take pictures like that? All right, I'm going to support you for $15,000 a year for five years. See my staff, and we'll make arrangements. Well, J.P. Morgan wound up supporting him for four or five times that amount over the course of the project. But without that seed money and that imprimatur of support from the, the heart of the artistic establishment in New York, it's not clear that Curtis would have been able to achieve what he did, is it? 
Yeah, that's correct. At that point, Curtis had probably spent around 25000 of his own money, had mortgaged the house. Collectors pounding on the door when he's out in the field, so Clara has to answer to that. And they, they were on the verge of bankruptcy. He was literally at the ends of his means. Say a word about Clara. There was a celebrated divorce. Clara does not come off very well in this conversation, but I feel <laughs> deep sympathy for her. He left her yeah. for basically for 30 years and yes. she had to hold the home fires together they had children uh, she was t trying to keep the portrait studio open when he would come home he was exhausted or he was in the dark room we owe a lot to her <laughs> yeah we we tend to forget the her the her part of the story and yeah if my husband was gone 10 or 11 months out of the year and um, left me hanging with the bag and to talk to all the debtors I, I wouldn't have been very happy either. But yeah, at that time, it was very, very scandalous to ask for a divorce. But Clara liked her high society. I think her family was that way prior to Curtis. And that's the type of life she was expecting. And um, at times, it was very questionable that that was happening. <laughs> we'll take a break here. When we come back, I want to talk further about Edward S. Curtis. I'm talking with my friends John and Colleen Graybill of Buena Vista, Colorado. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to an episode of Listening to America. Welcome back to Listening to America. When we went to break, we were talking about poor, long-suffering Clara. They got this divorce. It was front page banner headlines. It was bitter. Glass plates were broken to avoid the sharing of intellectual property, according to family tradition. He came back from one of his journeys and he was arrested for debt the minute he got off the boat in Seattle. This is a rough life. John. Yeah. So, you know, the hard part for me, Clay, is this is my great grandmother, you know, and I never got to meet the woman. I never got to meet Edward, uh, but they're my great grandparents. And it's hard to hear some of the things I've heard about her and what she went through and endured. I want to love her just like Edward. Don't have enough information really to go on about her. But I, one of the things that was passed down from Uncle Hal or Harold Curtis, the couple's firstborn, who traveled with Ed on great deal of the summer trips. Whenever his dad was out in the field, Hal would say that his mom, actually he called his mom a joiner, that uh, she was out joining all the social clubs in Seattle, leaving the kids at home with, you know, the two girls and Hal. And Hal ended up having to take care of the home and raise his sisters. And because of this, there was no love affair between the children and their mom. They always chose Edward's side. That had to have been hard on her. I can't imagine, you know, your kids choosing the parent that's never there. There. Yeah, I just, I can't imagine what that would have been like, but nonetheless, that's how, how that went down. You know, I think that from my own, you tell me, and, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to intrude on, on their, the sanctity of their own relationship. All relationships are, are complicated, but what you just said really struck me. I mean, it's not just that she's long suffering, trying to hold the, the family together. It sounds like with her own social ambitions, she was a neglectful mother to those children. And that was part of the issue. That's how Hal portrays it. Like Colleen touched on, a divorce back in that day was extremely scandalous. Uh, my grandmother, Florence, their third born child, uh, had enrolled at the University of Washington. And when this hit the papers, she tells the family uh, she was so embarrassed she dropped out of school. Right. I, I, you know, I never want that. I can't imagine. I have such sympathy for her. You know, it's easy to take his side because he's he, the achievement is one of the greatest you can possibly imagine. Imagine. I mean, just to those who are listening, just think for a moment if Edward S. Curtis had not done this. And he had something that I don't have. If you gave me $5 million and said, take the best possible camera equipment and anything you need and go take portraits of Native Americans, I could do that and they would be competent. But they wouldn't necessarily get through to the soul of, of those individuals. And somehow he had a rapport or a connection. Somehow mm -hmm. there was some magic, I can only call it magic, that occurred. And when you look at the best of his photographs, not everyone, but but most of them, you see that that they gave their souls to this moment. And they wouldn't have had to do that. They, they could have just simply you know sat for the photograph and, and, and moved on. 
but there was some kind of, I want you to try to explain it, the two of you. There was some kind of a magic that was on here. And if I took the same photographs, I doubt that I would ever get that because that's something that you can't learn. It's something that just is. There, there is certainly um, a skill to, to finding that moment and finding that, getting that expression that you're looking for that tells their story. And that, um, that doesn't happen a lot. Even with very skilled, technically correct photographers, find, finding that and pulling out that emotion in an image that you're creating is a very different skill. And that and, photograph is a one-off. So in other words, I could have a camera today. I could take 200 pictures in, in a minute of somebody. And right. then you could go pick the one that gets closest to your idea of what it should be. He gets this right. one shot at it. And right. that person has to hold that expression for four, five, six, maybe eight seconds, We don't, depending on you know the light. That makes it much more complicated and difficult than if you had the capacity to take all the frames you wanted. I think there's a difference too in when you you have to just be for that long and you can't you can't fake it. You can't fake a, a smile that you're happy and I think your true essence comes out when you have to just be still. And I think that's that's part of it too. But he 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 knew what he was doing. Clay, yes, Colleen's exactly right. And this process of photographing these people back in, in Curtis's time and for that matter, the same way we do it. I, I've had exposures that were 30 seconds long inside window light at, at ASA 2. That's all I got to work with. And so you make that work with a head brace. But it, it's this experience that Curtis had when he would go into a camp. He would go into a camp and just exist in the camp. And he would start helping out as he saw, you know, gathering wood or whatever it was for him. And eventually they would come talk to him and find out more. And it's my understanding that the key that got him in was his appreciation of their spirituality. Uh, he saw a great depth in their spirituality, and he even gave speeches where he talked about the importance of absolute religious freedom, because uh, the natives didn't have it then. It was in the Constitution for us white folk, but not for natives. And that was of utmost importance to him. And he saw this. And in this photograph that he would do, it's a collaborative experience. It's not like to Day. That person had to actually work with you to make that photo happen. And uh, through that, that connection and appreciation of their culture that he projected or they sensed, they would open up and you start to see that soul come out of the picture that was probably guarded for anybody else and never seen. You know, what you say is so important, John. He didn't just show up in Hopi land and say, all right, tomorrow morning I'm going to take 20 pictures lined up. I'll get them and then I'm out of here because i got to be Friday. I've got to be in, in the Navajo world. He would come. He'd spend weeks, sometimes months, no pressure. He'd be hauling wood. He would be doing drudge work, getting water from the creek or the pond, handling horses, doing any tasks that were put in front of him, uh, very relaxed. And then eventually when... People had come to see him as, as somebody who must mean it, because why else would you spend this amount of time here? Then they were available, maybe, to do the photographs. Even then, it wasn't easy, but, but he knew that, and this is why so many people have gone wrong in Indian country. They show up and say, here's what I want to do. Uh, let's do it to my, Let's do it today. Let's get this done. And then they're gone. And so it feels exploitative because, again, it's somebody taking rather than giving and taking. And I believe it's exactly the same in today's world. Absolutely. Whether we recognize that or not, it's the same today. Absolutely. So important that, you know, the patience that he showed, uh, he, I think he went back to the, to the Hopi world seven or eight times before he was finally allowed to be part of the, of the snake ceremony. Uh, he never got to do it in, in full measure. But when I read about this, it, it just about kills me. He, he helped to go collect the rattlesnakes. Try that sometime. And then he got to sleep in the kiva with like 200 rattlesnakes slithering around. It's like an Indiana Jones story. And they had native elders, who, uh, spiritual leaders, who would be fanning and singing to the snakes to keep them calm. I don't think Curtis was very calm in those kivas, but he did it because he wanted to be part of it. And they don't just give that to anybody. They only allowed that for someone that they had come to trust. He wanted to experience those things himself. It's one thing to just 
write your impression of it watching it but when you're in that moment and experiencing it it's much it's much different and I think he truly wanted to understand you know all these different ceremonies and different ways of life and different ways of thinking and he 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 wanted to experience those and and produce this work from his heart clay I I the snake dance I think is a perfect example he had to have had mind, body, and spirit in line and pure. Any alteration, any deviation, any doubt, uh, those snakes would have been all over him. You know? <laughs> and I believe the natives recognized this in them. They saw it. And yeah, the snake saw it too. You know, you may be the great grandson and I and I do love and respect you, but I do not see you in a kiva surrounded by a hundred rattlesnakes, John. I just I just I, I can't imagine it. Clay, I don't see myself there either. <laughs> there are, I've done other things, but not that. <laughs> that that's a that's a tough one. But but his persistence and the clarity and the purity of his heart paid off again and again and again. So He's publishing these. He told J.P. Morgan that it would be maybe five, maybe 10 years. Well, this stretched out to more than 30 years, including through the heart of the Great Depression. He was always broke. He never had enough money, never took any money himself, just enough to keep going. In fact, when he went through his, when he was arrested in Seattle, the judge asked him, well, surely some of that money that Morgan is providing goes to your own salary. And he said, no. And the judge said, are you crazy? I mean, are you, are you nuts? I mean, you're doing this, you're, you're donating all of your effort for the good of this project. And eventually he produces these 20 volumes. He thought of quitting a number of times, but he just wouldn't. Somehow he persevered. The perseverance alone is one of the most remarkable things about him because in those 25 or 30 years, he went through a divorce. Several of his children were ill at times. Uh, he lost plates. Uh, some of his staff, he didn't do this alone, some of his staff had to move on at a certain point, and he was left and, and felt a little betrayed by their departures. Uh, Roosevelt dies in 1919, so his sort of best friend uh, in the establishment is gone. It's amazing that he did it. And what's, what's so tragic about it is that when he finished, the country had kind of, in a way, lost interest. He then moves to Hollywood, lives with one of his children, winds up being a still photographer on movie sets, has a bunch of schemes, including a gold mining scheme, does a lot of writing, never really gets the credit that he deserves. And when he dies in 1952, he gets a 72 word obituary in the New York Times. It's it's not fair. It's not fair to the achievement of this great man. Probably not, but it's uh, indicative what, with what we see, how our culture, the white culture, has treated the indigenous population for the past 530 some years. We do not recognize them. We don't give them the time of day or the credit that they deserve. Uh, just just like Curtis's own experience with, the, with his project, that people lose interest in it and move on, uh, which is really sad. There's so much that we need to look back at and learn from these people, uh, especially in today's world. We, we need this more than I think we realize, how to take care of Mother Earth and uh, how to recognize the spiritual world that we live in and uh, how to coexist in it. Colleen, you're the writer in the family. And so far, you know, all those those images that wound up on the cutting room floor, many are lost, but we have lots, and you have them because of your relationship, um, yours and John's, to the family, to Florence. You've published two books. Tell us about them. Well, it kind of started in two ways. One was we um, had found a descendant who was from Alaska, whose family was actually in Colorado Springs, which is only two hours from us. So in meeting with a couple different people in their family, they were looking through our notebooks of Alaska photographs that um, has been passed down through the family. And they're starting to go, I've never seen this picture of my grandmother. I've never seen this picture of my mother. And and so it started to raise some questions in our minds of, are these not published? How, do, how does the family not know these exist? Probably shortly before that, I don't remember the exact timeline, was we had come and listened to one of your presentations. And when we were giving you some additional um, information that the family has that's not really out 
there, you you challenged us. Oh boy. To, <laughs> this is partially your fault. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's Clay's fault. <laughs> and yet I get no residuals. But go ahead. So we met in Seattle. I challenged you. You challenged us to get the other information out there that it's it's the, the family's responsibility to add to this great story. We really took that to heart. I absolutely um, took that to heart, Clay. I apologize. Yeah. I formally and publicly apologize. But so then you you decided you'd publish a book. Well, uh, yeah, then COVID hit and our all our travel plans of seeing descendants went to sideways. Sideways. And so I had to find something to do because I can't just do nothing. So I thought, well, I'm going to compare these photos. And I I found right off 200 images just from Alaska that were not published as part of the North American Indian. We need to publish this. We need to share this with the descendants and the people of Alaska. We need to share this with Curtis enthusiasts who have interest in this. We need to share this with historians because there's information in those photographs. And so that's kind of how it started with Alaska. Um, but you had a great advantage on Alaska because he went with his daughter Beth. This was the last journey, yeah. right? Well, she kept a journal and that journal you were able to publish with the yeah. photographs of that that great last expedition. Pieces and parts of the journal, of Curtis's journal, had been published, but never the whole story. You know, as you're reading this, I'm like, he should have died like 10 times on this trip. <laughs> <laughs> fighting the, the Bering Sea, and we just felt it was a fascinating story to give people a little firsthand knowledge of this wasn't easy. Being able to, to publish these images for the Alaska Natives was incredibly important to us. What is that book? What's its title and how can people get it? Edward S. Curtis, Unpublished Alaska, and it's available through our website and on Amazon. Website is? Is CurtisLegacyFoundation.org, and then you can just go to the gift shop. Unpublished Alaska, and now most recently, just weeks ago, and I have a copy right here, it's Spectacular Unpublished Plains. Then I picked the next region. It was the plains. We went through, figured out what had been, what's already been published in the North American Indian. And then we also went through all kinds of other Curtis related books because we wanted to put out things that were unpublished. So even though it may not have been in the North American Indian, if it had been published in someone else's book, then we didn't want to add that to ours because it had, we want to give that credit to them as publishing. It. So you, I mean, get me get this straight. You are only publishing, at least so far as you are aware, of photographs that have never before been published. Correct. Correct. So and I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm if just, one or two I'm, or ten are in some other coffee table book, you do not republish them. Right. Right. If we found them, yeah. So we ended we ended up with just under two hundred images in the Plains book. Along with those images, we have either essays or quotes from ten different Native Americans from the Plains area because we felt it was important to give that voice to them and have them express how they felt about Curtis. His work. What's your next book? Our next book is Southwest. Unpublished yes. Southwest. Unpublished Southwest. So there'll be what, the 20, 20 volumes before this is done, right? <laughs> if my estimates are correct for Southwest, we may end up having to have two volumes of it. How long does we, it take you to put together one of these books? About a year and a half. So you gather the photographs. Of course, you scan them at the very, very highest resolution. Where Curtis has written about them, you tend to quote Curtis's description of the photo. He doesn't always, unfortunately, do that. We wish right. that he had, but that's right. 40,000 paragraphs. Other natives, um, contemporary natives are commenting. Jean Eater, a, a very prominent Lakota woman, provides mm -hmm. the preface to your second volume. You know, these are, these are really extraordinary. I just want people to know that these are very, very handsome books to hold in your hand and to page through, great as gifts. But also, this is of exceeding importance because you know, we think, oh, all those Curtis photographs, but the public has only seen a fraction of all those Curtis photographs. Again, it's important for us to share these images with the descendants. You know, we've, we've found families, white man runs him, his family, multiple images that they've never seen of him before. Your best uh, estimate, how many more years is this going to take, this thing you're doing? <laughs> 
Um, well, we've got Southwest and Northwest, and then we have the Descendants Project book that we'll publish as well. So, oh, 10 years anyway. <laughs> I'm hoping they're done before that. Well, no, I, I'm trying to do the math here. You know, it looks like, ten, but luckily you're both in your early 20s. And so you've got all the time in the world, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's been an enormous pleasure talking with you. I hope people will go to your website. I hope they will buy your books. But more importantly than that, I just want to congratulate you for doing work that is of the, really the highest cultural importance. And you're doing it for the best of all possible reasons because it needs to be done. I've been talking with John and Colleen, my friends, the Gray Bills from Buena Vista in Colorado. Uh, good luck to you, happy holidays, and let's talk again about Edward S. Curtis. <laughs>